All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Speakeasy JS. Uh, I'm Faros. I'll be your host this evening. And uh, if you haven't been to Speakeasy before, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So uh, this is a JavaScript meetup, and we like to invite speakers who talk about mad science, hacking, and their experiments with us. And um, mad science is about doing things for no other reason than because you can. Following your curiosity, building things that make people say, whoa, I didn't know that was possible. And uh, today we have a talk that's uh, very much mad science. Uh, today we have uh, a, a speaker who is going to be sharing um, a really cool project called uh, called Web Native. And um, so Brooke is going to Brooke is our speaker. I'm going to introduce her here, here for you really quickly. So she's the, the founder of uh, Fission, um, Code and Coffee, Beam Vancouver, and Vancouver Functional Programmers Meetup. Um, and she gives uh, keynotes talks all the time and is a frequent panelist at different meetups. Um, she's really interested in functional programming, programming language theory, principled software, scalable and fault tolerant systems, and developing teams. And previously, she participated in Ethereum standardization, um, which is super cool and, um, uh, and, and it's actually kind of related to the, to the topic today. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brooke. Um, the floor is yours. Take it away. Great, thanks. Uh, so, share my screen. Awesome. Can you see the the slide? Mm -hmm. We can see it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm going to be talking about web native, how to put a full stack directly in the browser. Uh, or uh, I guess another uh, title for this could be the beginnings of a web OS, except that uh, web OS is already a uh, a thing. So uh, I guess the longer title can be a browser-based file system with location independence, user controlled data, self-modifying apps and serverless auth, and some surprising things we've learned along the way. Uh, so uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, uh, pretty much what I have on this slide, but yeah, I'm the CTO <laughs> at Fission, uh, uh, where we're doing you know the, the bulk of the development on uh, web native, but everything is 100% you know, uh, open source. Um, you can self-host all of that stuff. Uh, and yeah, our job is to obsolete backends and uh, DevOps, I guess, by extension, one function at a time. Uh, and uh, yeah, founder founded the functional programming meetup locally here, Code and Coffee, and was involved in the community for a bit. Uh, and most of the open source stuff that I'm known for is actually in Haskell and Elixir. So if you like those languages, uh, there's some uh, libraries to check out there. Also, I like to give out uh, stickers when I give talks, uh, which obviously we can't do in person here. Uh, so if you go to shop.fission.codes and use this code speakeasyjs, there's a sticker pack that's specific for uh, speakeasy, and uh, we'll ship those to you anywhere in the world. Super cool. Yeah. So yeah, as you said, this is the JavaScript meetup for mad science hacking and experiments. And I was thinking about it uh, earlier. I was like, oh man, you know, like which which of these, you know, do I fit into? And then I realized that this is an and and not an or. And uh, honestly, I, I think we kind of have all three of these covered, um, which is which is great. So feeling pretty confident going into this one. Um, so the starting conditions or the I don't know if it's like a problem, but like you know the the sorts of things that we're trying to solve for. So this. Uh, this next picture is going to look pretty familiar. Right? Um, the web today really came from, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, um, and has some assumptions built into it, right? So we have a user, they have a machine, and uh, the browser on here isn't that powerful. Uh, and we're going to put some data uh, in some, you know, shared space somewhere else. And uh, in order to connect to that over the internet, we're going to need to put a server in front of the database. Right? Uh, also, and that server is you know much stronger, you know, beefier than uh, than your browser. And so, uh, interesting to note that you know in the era of uh, Java and C plus plus, that this also kind of looks a bit like an object, right? You know, you have some data and then an interface wrapped around it. Um, anyway, so you connect to this, you can send it messages now, and great, everything works. And then a bunch of other people also want to use this, which means now we need to put some access control in front of the data um, so that you know Alice can't read Bob's um, you know, uh, unpublished blog posts, you know, all, all of that stuff. Uh, so lots of people want to use this. Now we have to scale up. We put a, a load balancer in front of this thing. Um, 
you know, horizontally scale out a bunch of servers and a bunch of databases, and we've got to keep the databases in sync and make sure that the access control works and is is all up to date, right? Um, which works really well, but also, you know, does have this, this rise in complexity. When really what we want to do is I want to be able to create some content, uh, a website, a web app, uh, uh, a post, a, a picture, something, and just share it with other people, right? And especially with uh, software, if you want to share software with somebody else, the, the answer today really is, um, you know, containerize it, ship it to somebody else, and hopefully they know how to run a Docker container. Uh, and so it was this way for many years. Um, and that's literally, you know, the, the internet that we have today, which is fantastic, right? But you know, is the way we do things today the one true way? And is this how things will look in you know fifty or hundred years? Probably not. Um, you know, it's been this this evolution of you know we only been doing this for thirty years. That's just a you know a blip in time at uh, historical scales, right? But uh, sometimes you know people going and exploring different paths can find other um, other. Uh, points in the solution space, right? So it's possible that we're currently stuck in a local maxima, and that there could be more interesting or better or more efficient ways of doing things uh, out there. So natural consequences of this view of the world, right, is a very server focused. If you want to do anything with this, you have to learn more of the stack. I talk to people who want to be front end only developers, and they're saying, well, I'm having to pick up uh, back end programming as well, which is fine, right? It's great. It's just it means that there's this you know larger stack and you become more of a generalist over time. <clears throat> uh, the single source of truth lives on the server, and now you have to scale out as time goes. So you use, there is this focus on DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes, et cetera. There's also this base assumption that there's latency over a network. Um, and the front end is, yes, concerned with um, display, but also with synchronizing data. Um, off of this single source of truth. Uh, so a server really fundamentally is three things, right? It's an auth gatekeeper because we have lots of different people in the database. It gives you resource availability so that uh, you can access the same data across multiple machines and gives you out of, bound, uh, out of band compute. So running batch tasks or as somebody else is writing uh, or sending requests, you know, we're actually doing not just storing it, but actually doing compute on those. So if we take this and we just turn it, you know, totally inside out, right? Um, another common uh, uh, way of doing programming is, you know, with a native app. Uh, so phone, for example, uh, and say you're on iOS, you get uh, an SDK from Apple and it provides you three things, identity, compute, and storage, which looks a whole lot like what a server gives you. Um, so let's just, see if we can take those things and put them uh, in a browser. So it's not 1991 anymore, right? Uh, we have a fundamentally different landscape. Uh, browsers are super powerful. Uh, serverless uh, is on the rise, edge computing, we're starting to see a bit of, so you can almost think of web native as like post serverless or like, like edge plus plus where the edge device literally is your browser. Um, and we have these new primitives, right? Location independent data, which I'll talk about browser-based encryption, um, and new consistency models like CRDTs and Raft. And really, the, the overall picture is going from REST, which is state transfer, to state synchronization. We have different views of data, and we want to um, make those look uh, the same. Uh, new features naturally fall out of this architecture. We're talking uh, you know, uh, even recently uh, with the team about doing things like uh, progressive login, where uh, you can do 100% of everything in the application except for um, uh, distribute um, your changes to, to other people that aren't currently online, right? And then you need a username. Um, everything's offline first, you know, uh, encrypted at rest. You can do all of these things. Um, we are still, uh, despite being able to do these th all these things offline, we are increasingly networked. Um, but local first means that the network can be very efficient because we assume that everything needs to work directly on your machine. So uh, Ink and Switch is an industrial R&D lab. They do actually uh, uh, lots of really nice work in this area. And they have this uh, fantastic article called Local First Software. Super recommend everybody uh, read that. So the main things that we're using to make this work um, 
uh, in addition to writing just a bunch of custom code is the Web Crypto API, Web Workers, Service Workers, IndexedDB, and uh, PWAs. Not that you need the PWA bit, but uh, it happens to work really nicely with this, with this model. So how many steps can we skip? Typically, uh, you're setting up a traditional app. You need uh, a fair bit right, uh, to get things going. And it's not to say that the SRE doesn't care about what's happening to the user, but uh, it's definitely um, uh, not part of their you know, day to day you know, interaction job. Right? Um, you know, uh, front end dev is much more concerned with how, um, you know, what's the actual user experience going to be like. Right? So if we can get closer together, flatten the stack into a browser and then some SDKs, you can get hopefully faster iteration, lower the barrier to entry so that more people can build apps with less you know, experience in education and more of a focus on actually solving the problem that end users want. Uh, constraints, vanilla browser, no plugins, has to work on mobile with a single device. UX has to be, uh, people shouldn't notice that anything's changed, right? It has to be as good, if not better. Uh, and there can be no distinction between what you're running locally and production. So as you're working in VS Code or Emacs or whatever, as you hit save, that should automatically be uh, reachable by other people or um, at, at very minimum, exactly the same uh, experience you'll have when you deploy it. Um, because everything's offline, user control of identity and data, and it should be at least as secure, if not more secure than existing apps. And we actually think we've gone uh, quite, quite a bit further in the, the security direction. Um, so a little video of what this uh, can look like. So this is most of our first party apps uh, or demo apps are done in Elm, but uh, we have somebody uh, on the team doing a React sample app. So this is still uh, his work in progress. But you know, we have a little note, we can type some text into it. Uh, you know, hit the save button, great. And then uh, we can go to a completely different app at a totally different domain. So this is like a Dropbox-like experience. And uh, the data is synchronized under this application too. The data lives with the user, not each independent app. So we could actually go in, um, I don't show it in the, in the video, but you can actually type in here and hit save and it'll be reflected back in the notes app as well. Um, same thing, so Diffuse is a distributed music player uh, with a web native backend. Um, here it shows there's this almost like OAuth-like looking thing that we'll talk about in a bit, uh, where the user is giving access to, uh, you know, do you wanna have, you know, shared playlists in your public and private file system and the ability to write app-specific data for this app. Um, so then they give that, and uh, worth noting uh, that, none of that auth actually left the machine at all. That all happened totally locally between, um, between these two apps. And then, yeah, you can load up a, you know, load up some song and, uh, you know, skip around in it, all of the, the stuff you'd expect to be able to do. Uh, here's what the actual code looks like. Um, so this is the, the auth uh, portion for the, the React app. Um, and again, none of this stuff actually leaves the browser. So we have this uh, redirection flow. Um, and then on the uh, right-hand side, uh, you can see it says uh, web native dot initialize the app name and the creator, uh, set the states, uh, and then you know did did that succeed or not? Right. So fairly straightforward flow. And then this is the actual editing of an uh, of a note. And about halfway down in the try, you can see file system dot add, and then this path, and then publish, which means actually persist this and uh, broadcast to anybody who's listening that this has um, uh, this has been updated. So one way to think about this is if React is just the view layer, then Web Native is just the data layer, right? And but it turns out that the data layer touches lots of different things. So the stack for this, um, you know, you've seen now API and, and a little bit of uh, app logic. Um, everything below this line is uh, core tech. So we've had to build uh, uh, or, or adapt uh, identity, uh, encrypted storage, um, uh, a user controlled uh, version of JWT. Um, we connect into a bunch of transports the file system, um, web native file system, which is a durable file store. Uh, we're working on a structured store as well. So like a, a distributed database 
And then uh, offline and async file sharing, collaboration, instant sync. So if you have multiple people uh, being able to type in the same document, with multiple cursors, and then global aggregation, which is interesting because when we flip this model, um, we have things like, you know, offline is trivial, uh, encryption at rest, to, you know, super easy now. But uh, doing, say, if you have a social network, you're not following your friends or your friends are friends, that's still uh, straightforward, but doing like the Twitter fire hose of people you've never heard of before, uh, tweeting stuff, that's a more challenging case. So we're doing that with um, uh, over a, a gossip broadcast. Um, what all this means is uh, you should be able to get on a plane, if we can ever get on planes again, uh, with no Wi-Fi, build an app from scratch, uh, register as the first um, production user of the app, make a bunch of changes, edit photos, you know, et cetera. Um, and when you get off the plane and open your, uh, you know, connect to Wi-Fi, you're already live and every, all those changes you made are pers uh, persist through this. So those actual production usage. Um, because code is data, we can move data to compute, but also compute to data, which is interesting and mo moving around functions as well. Um, publishing updates from inside the browser, because again, uh, we can capture any of this stuff as uh, just regular files. So you should be able to edit um, you know, uh, in the inspector and then push that, which also means we haven't done this yet, but you can have self-modifying apps. So the first time somebody runs something, you can then cache that and even bake it right into the page. Um, and then the next time somebody needs to do something, we can keep baking these down. Um, and also anyone can be a service provider, right? So you should be able to clone apps or provide storage or compute for, for anybody in the system. So uh, I'm making all these, these promises, great, fantastic. Um, but like, how do we actually get a pointer if everything starts offline, right? We don't have a database with, a, with uh, tables and um, uh, primary keys, right? So content addressing, um, you'll definitely see uh, more and more of as, as time goes on. Uh, so it won't be just limited to, to this. Um, we use uh, IPFS underneath the interplanetary file system. You don't have to use um, uh, IPFS, it's just convenient. Uh, a lot of stuff's already built for us. Uh, so the string, hey, speak easy, we can get, get its hash, it's a, a SHA-256 hash, I believe. Um, and that becomes the key for, um, for that string. And if we add any other character to it, the hash is completely different. Um, and that also works on just, you know, arbitrary data. So today, you know, you go, you look at DNS, that turns into an IP address, you get routed to that virtual address at the, you know, a physical location. And then you say, hey, server, I would like whatever lives at this path. And then you get the content back, right? It was really focused on the physical network and not the data. So uh, if we want to have a universal schema, um, we add one extra layer of abstraction, which is to hash the content and everybody uses that as the identifier, as the key. Um, so uh, we don't have to anymore go, well, who has it? We can just ask everybody that we know about, hey, do you have this thing? And they can send it to you. And that can, yeah, that can be a peer-to-peer -peer network, but it can also be, you know, three storage providers that you, uh, you know, subscribed to. It, it literally doesn't matter, right? Um, and so you have this universal relationship. So you can create data offline and still have a, a consistent key when you come back online. Uh, you can also hash link data. So uh, in this case, this uh, this chunk of JSON is this QM123456, is its hash. And inside of that, we'll have some links and another hash pointing to some more data and more data and more data. So then uh, we can load up that first hash and follow these paths. And it, none of those paths can change um, because if we change uh, any anything in there, all those hashes will change as well, right? So we always have some way of talking about this specific version of this file. And if we want different versions, we have to change this uh, this top pointer, right? This, this head. Thinking about them as pointers is actually really interesting. There's um, people using this idea to build uh, uh, operating systems with uh, content addressing as well. So it's like, you know, galaxy scale operating system basically, which is very interesting. Um, there's trade-offs, right? Caching becomes trivial. 
but we don't have identity anymore because it's all equality. It's all just this hash. And uh, we run into Zuko's triangle, which is that you can have uh, identifiers that are human, me human meaningful, secure, or decentralized. And you get two of the three of those. Um, so people don't really want to pass around IP addresses or hashes, right? So we have DNS for that. Uh, so we've made the choice to use DNS to distribute hashes at a human readable name um, and using text records, uh, DNS text records. So that, that resolves then down to this content address, um, which you can then ask uh, whoever um, you're connected to for, for this data, and then that comes back in. And if that person then you know, uh, deploys it to a server or a peer-to-peer -peer network or whatever um, and goes offline, uh, you're still able to request that from anybody else that you're connected to if they have it. So it's a universal namespace. That's great. Um, but that also means that anybody can grab data from anybody else, right? So that's that seems pretty insecure. So uh, we need to fix the leaky pipes in the general case. So data is now grouped by user, not by app, which we were saying before, right? So uh, instead of it being, you know, Twitter has everybody's tweets and whatever, Instagram has everybody's photos, uh, Alice has uh, data for multiple apps. And apps can be given, you know, some carved out section of this data and also cross uh, multiple users' data, and you know, uh, can share data between apps as well. So, file system layout: uh, public, private, uh, and then shared uh, sections as well. Uh, this looks a whole lot like the file system on your computer, right? So you have a raw bytes, then you can wrap that in a file which has some extra metadata, uh, and then wrap that again in, in directories. Um, gives you a consistent interface and uh, arbitrary metadata, right? So you can have MIME types, creators, sources, all of that stuff. Um, because everything is hash linked and content addressed, it's actually easier to make all of the data structures persistent. So uh, if you've used Apple's Time Machine or you know Git history, anything like that, uh, all the data that goes through this is uh, versioned. So here's version zero or revision zero, and then we can attach new updates to things. So, you know, avatars revision one here contains uh, the caricature and headshot, which the previous one didn't have. Um, so generation zero has the, you know, the orange and uh, green sections and generation one has blue and green, but you can always get back the orange parts. If we lay this out in a different way, we can see how uh, this forms a, well, it looks like a tree, but it's uh, actually a, a directed acyclic graph. And so if we take all of the you know, hash link, we only need the top of this tree to pass around. To be, you know, here's the pointer for the entire structure. Um, we want private data. So we take each file, chunk them, encrypt them with AES-256, which is uh, in the Web Crypto API and also what the US government uses for top, top secret files. Uh, it's uh, also considered uh, quantum secure, at least quantum hard. Um, so uh, quantum computers you know, aren't, aren't really going to be an issue uh, for this, at least for, for quite some time. Um, and we uh, take the CBOR, uh, so uh, you know, like, like JSON, just encoded differently, um, and encrypt that. And all of the um, the links down, so all of the file paths, come with a key to more data that is encrypted with that totally separate key. So it's keys that give you the ability to unwrap some uh, data that includes more keys and more keys all the way down. Um, when you decrypt it, you then rediscover the structure and you get it looks exactly the same as the, the public side. Uh, the only difference is you have these keys uh, around. Um, if you use Google Drive or Dropbox, anything like that, you want to be able to give uh, permission, you know, read access to some sub portion of the uh, um, of a directory. Uh, so because we have this you know, recursive key scheme, uh, if you want to give the key for just that red section, you can give that and they won't be able to see the orange bit. Or if you give the orange bit, 
because that contains the key for the red bit as well in uh, as a file, uh, you know, you get this this recursive, you know, whichever piece you want to give people access to. Um, this then gets, we don't want to uh, expose too much about metadata. So we then uh, um, hash all of the, the names and place them in this, uh, in this tree. So it totally scrambles uh, what is related to what. Um, this is actually more efficient than the public tree because uh, it's self-balancing. We can use hashes, right? Um, and uh, uh, at four levels deep, because we have a branching factor of 16, uh, we get about 65,000 uh, files. So it becomes very, very quick to look things up, even if they're uh, very deep in the uh, decrypted structure. Um, file sharing uh, is literally just key exchange, which is like what uh, happens with uh, TLS, right? Um, everybody has a, a public private key pair, and then you can use that to exchange um, the keys that points into the tree that you can then decrypt. Uh, and you then want to, once you have one of these, you want to copy it so that uh, you never lose that key. So great, we can now read recursively encrypted trees that live anywhere, um, regardless of provider or if you're offline, so great. Um, how do we do writes if the server can't check the content? Oops. Uh, so we have user-controlled serverless universal auth and identity, or a user-controlled authorization network. Uh, so the W3C, Microsoft, a bunch of others, um, the government of uh, British Columbia, which is the province where I live, um, are working on the spec uh, called uh, decentralized ID. Um, we're using the simplest form of this, which is literally just you can prove that you have access to this um, private key that's associated with the public key. Right, so it's it's just you, you can literally sign data with it that proves that you're who you say you are. Um, we're used to uh, um, ACLs, so access control lists. Uh, we've moved to OCAP uh, or Object Capability Model, which gives you instead of having to look up in a table what is this person allowed to do, the certificate itself says these are all the things they're allowed to do, or it's directly the key to decrypt the thing or you know whatever it is. Uh, anything that you create. Uh, you get access to, and you can delegate any subset of access that you have to somebody else. So, um, uh, right, and we're not the first ones to, to do this, right? X509 certificates, Spooky Auth, Google has a system called Macaroons that's similar. Um, but fundamentally, uh, our take on this is it's a JWT with some special keys in it, uh, sender and receiver, that's the audience and issuer there, uh, time bounds. Uh, you can put in this uh, facts, FCT, sort of arbitrary stuff you want to have signed. The interesting parts here are the attenuation and proof. So attenuation says, I have access to some resources, and I'm going to delegate to the receiver these uh, permissions that, that I have, and it's going to be some subset of, of what I can do. And the way that I prove that I'm allowed to do this is I include whoever the JWT that somebody sent me with the rights that I have, all the way back to the root. So the, the original creator of that resource. So it has this, this nested structure, which you might notice the file system also has this nest, nested structure. So it ends up being really nice um, alignment. And these are non-exportable 2048-bit RSA keys in web crypto. And for the, we have a CLI as well. Um, that's all uh, elliptic curves. And we're starting to do some stuff with uh, BLS. BLS super interesting. If you're into, into crypto, uh, check it out. Um, this also really simplifies when you're trying to do um, uh, authorization of an application. In fact, it, it doesn't even have to leave the device, as I mentioned, I think now a few times, um, because we don't have to talk to an authorization server to generate a, a JWT. You either have the key and a cert certificate or you don't. It's verifiable and user originated. And so instead of having this, I think it's like 12 or 13 steps in a, a OAuth flow, which is on the left, we have four steps to uh, talk to, not, not even just an application, this is through an application to a server. So final thoughts to, to wrap it up. Um, we have a lot more coming uh, as well. This is um, uh, so, you know the, the high level overview, but uh, we're working on a, uh, when you do parallel computing, there's uh, embarrassingly parallel. We're working on an embarrassingly distributed deductive database. Uh, so a 
uh, where you can take um, arbitrary uh, sets of facts, join them together or pull them apart, whatever bits you need, um, and then share this data across many apps with a universal schema, which is, uh, you know, these aren't things that are concepts we've invented. It's just very, I think it's pretty cool. Um, so you can assert, refute, time, and have a source for those things, merge and split easily, you have access control with different views. So if you know I'm the team lead and I have more, you know, whatever Trello cards that I can see than uh, a contractor, uh, we can load in the same database with different sources uh, and some some overlap and see slightly different views. And uh, underneath the engine powering all of this is a variant on data logs. So we're saying JSON on the front, data log in the back. Um, if you want to help define the API for this, because we're still in the, the R&D phase for this, um, you can book some time in with uh, actually the guy who wrote the React app from, from earlier, that little notes app um, uh, at calendly.com slash waka. Um, universal distributed compute, we can actually do directly on top of the file system, uh, including as long as it's not going you know completely off platform. Um, uh, rolling back uh, compute that was done improperly. If you do do something that's like truly side effectful, like sending an email or, or a tweet or something, uh, obviously you can't roll that back, but you can get a confirmation that it was completed and put that into an event stream. Um, again, this is the that and you know total stack where we're going, and uh, uh, you know this is a lot of detail about how things work, but uh, we should have just this. SDK that feels like you're interacting with storage, right? Um, and final parting thought, uh, we, we really see this as being part of a 60 plus year trend uh, where the barrier to entry to computing has been getting lower. So we started with really bespoke stuff, then moved down to private ownership. You know, you have a mainframe and then you start time sharing and cloud computing. We're now at serverless and edge, and it's slowly moving into this direction, we think, of uh, universal uh, storage and compute. So thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm on mute. Uh, I just wanted to say amazing. Good job. That was an amazing Thanks. talk and super interesting. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I had a, a bunch of uh, questions for you. Um, mm. for, and we also have people in the chat. So if anyone has questions, feel free to just post um, from whatever platform you're watching this from. And um, if it's a good question, we'll, I'll go ahead and um, I'll ask Brooke and uh, you know, you'll get to get a chance to have your questions answered. Um, but I'll go ahead and start it off with some of the things I was thinking while you were presenting. Um, well, first of all, my first impression was just what an amazing uh, like, uh, like idea for a project. The scope is so ambitious. You're trying to basically make everything Perfect, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's uh, it would be really great if if, if this is this is how you could build apps today. So, um, I, I guess um, one question I have is sort of what what state is it in today? Like, what could I if I went and tried to build something with with this today? Um, mm -hmm. What what could I build? Like, what would be a good use case for it? And kind of like what would be um, the rough edges where I would run into difficulties? Mm -hmm. uh, so today you'd be able to build um, sort of like your uh, common uh you know web app uh, notes app we have a, a, actually a bunch of people building notes apps for for some reason on this uh a fair number of music apps so music players uh people building ways of storing their synths um uh, integrating with the web midi um uh, api it's like you know all of that stuff uh really keeping it to because uh, we haven't built that global aggregation piece um, yet, so you can link to other people's data, but you need to know who they are, right? Um, so building an app for yourself, your community, your team, all of that works. Um, but if you need like, you know, we're gonna build a marketplace and people will just be able to put stuff up on the marketplace when you don't know who they are, you'll need a server component for that still. Okay, makes sense. So, so basically like if I was building Twitter, um, it seems like I would be able to, if I knew who my friends were in advance somehow by them sharing like an identifier with me, then I could follow them. But um, I wouldn't be able to like, just like search for like a random term and see who's tweeting about that topic. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. That yeah, makes yeah, sense. We're, we're, we're gonna get there, but it's just not built yet. No. Right, okay, cool, that makes sense. So you think the sweet spot is, is, is uh, like there's, there, there's, um, 
there's sort of enough uh, there today that it's it's worth. There's there are advantages to building something with this system even even today before it's sort of fully fully finished. Oh yeah, yeah, to totally. Uh, we've been trying to focus on like the the really um, uh, the the bits that will like I mean, a they're building blocks for more things, but also um, uh, the bits where they're they're you know there is pain. Uh, back uh, you know earlier during the pandemic, we had interest before like actually if we were at the state where it are now it might have actually maybe worked more but um saying well you know is this hipaa compliant could we keep uh contact tracing data in here we're like you know totally it's totally controlled by the user right so mm. yeah super cool so what got you interested in this uh this area of research and of, of development mm. uh it's a good question um in in a lot of ways um this is uh Kind of, I've had the edges of this for for a while. Not not exactly necessarily this form, right? Um, uh, a lot of people would would uh, you know say um, uh, you know that it sounds uh, it sounds like a little bit like Heroku or a little bit like this, a little bit like that. And then um, uh, you know, just developed an interest in distributed computing. Uh, ended up in the uh, Web three space for a bit, and went, "Wow, you know, lots of this stuff is." Um, or sorry, actually, I ended up in Web three because of um, uh, uh, PLT, pro programming language theory, and like correctness. Uh, because at the time, you know, you have to make sure that, uh, sir, on Ethereum, uh, you know, people's stuff isn't getting lost, right? So ended up in there because of that, and looking around, being like, "Wow, there's like all of this." you know, moon magic happening, but it's all in this tiny little uh, community that doesn't really talk as much to the, the broader, um, broader, you know, web development uh, area. So like, what can I take from here and apply it to problems that I've had as a web dev um, and, and see where it goes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. From my time going in and, and getting, getting my master's and doing a little bit of uh, like reading, reading research papers and kind of writing, writing some stuff, it's totally there's like it's two worlds you know people who are building practical things and then people who are writing papers and who are thinking about yeah. the cutting edge of cs research it's like they don't even talk um it's yeah. wild <laughs> yeah yeah well let's see is there any question in the chat that stands out um that you would you'd like to ask let's see uh or sorry that you'd like to answer um oh there's a question about uh hypercore that's that's probably mm. interesting have you ever explored using using hypercore as a transport maybe instead of um IPFS or because you, you mentioned it was sort of replaceable. Yeah, uh, absolutely is. Um, yeah, we we looked at it. Um, uh, IPFS just happened to hit the sweet spot on, on a few few things. Uh, when I mentioned earlier, um, Ink and Switch, uh, they um, uh, have a project called um, Hypermerge. Uh, that's a CRDT built on top of uh, Hypercore. Just you know, super cool and and hits in, in roughly this space, you know, similar. Um, the one of the um, downsides is that you need to always keep this um, uh, this log of, of events and we want, you know, a bunch of other structures as well. Um, not that you can't do it, but yeah, it's um, uh, something that TLDR, uh, something we've looked at um, probably uh, prior to going to Hypercore, um, there's been interest from people talking about like, well, could you just do this over just straight HTTP or Braid or, or something like that? Uh, so we'd probably go in that direction first. Mm -hmm. So what are the other um, open source projects or uh, protocols uh, that that you like drew inspiration from when coming up with this? I know the ones are obviously the ones that you mentioned that you're using directly and the standards yeah. that you're using directly, but um, is there anything else that you think people like should take a look at? Any pointers to interesting resources that, that people should look at? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of stuff. Uh, so in the, the Web3 space, um, uh, there's um, Wallet Connect, which is again, this idea of like, well, let's just take it outside of any particular app and make things just you know uh, uh, agnostic um, for the database stuff, because that's largely where my head is lately. Um, uh, Datomic or DataScript. So DataScript is the JavaScript um, implementation, uh, open source implementation of Datomic, uh, which is this style of database, which is um, uh, actually written in ClojureScript, but uh, like super interesting having this uh, uh, super um, uh, flexible um, 
uh, database right in your browser. Uh, if anybody watching is familiar with uh, Roam, uh, which is like a, a note-taking app uh, with like very linked uh, notes, they, they're all data script underneath. Um, so yeah, like definitely a few of those. Um, we started working on this uh, before Solid, uh, which is Tim Berners-Lee's um, uh, project, uh, which is this same basic idea, but just with more, um, uh, you know, uh, with, with more XML basically, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but yeah, Solid's super interesting as well. They have this concept of pods. So in the same way that we have this file system, they have a pod that you host somewhere and that is across all of your um, your apps as well. So it's a similar kind of architecture uh, in there too. And so we, we definitely, you know, borrow ideas from that and from RDF and, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Beaker browser as well. The the concept of being able to like bring your data to the app. Um, I think that was one of the things that uh, I thought was the coolest about Beaker. Mm -hmm. um, it's like you you if you don't like what an app is doing, if they make a change that's user hostile in some way, like they put ads or something in there, or they they just you don't like the UI, they just changed it too. You can always just um, fork it you have your own app now, and then you just point it to the data that you want it to read. And the data mm -hmm. is just your data that's that's just sitting there on your computer. And it's your, also, I guess, your friend's data, which is also just synced to your computer. And it's such an empowering way of thinking about you know, how apps can work. It's really great. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Beaker Browser, yeah, it's like probably one of the closest things to what we're doing. Um, yeah, like lots of respect for, for that project. In a lot of ways, we're kind of like a Beaker Browser in other browsers, right? Right, um, right. To, to some degree, it's like it's pretty similar. And the idea of like cloning or forking an app, like totally, you can totally do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So, so if you had to like think about like the well, so I mean, you've obviously put a ton of work into this. I actually, you know what, let's let, let me ask you about that. Like, I was actually wondering. So, <laughs> I, you mentioned that you work at Fission and that you, I think you yeah. co-founded it, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so could you maybe mention a little bit about that? What's the story there? And like, um, when did you start that? How is it related to um, to Web Native and what you've described today? And then kind of like, I don't know, how many people are, are working with you on it? And yeah, what, what, what can you share about that? Yeah, uh, so sure. Uh, Fission in a lot of ways, I guess, like is Web Native or it's, it's the, the funded team to work on uh, Web Native. Um, so my co-founder, uh, Boris and I, um, uh, you know, had a, a company in the um, uh, Web3 space. Uh, we're looking around being like, there's cool tech here, but like we want to work with, uh, you know, 99% of devs, not 1% not of devs. So let's see what we can take and, and, and go. Um, got some funding and, and started the company. Um, and uh, yeah, like with, with exactly this, this vision in mind, um, some, some of the, the slides, um, you know, explaining how it works are like literally from the original pitch deck, right? So um, it's, yeah, so we were, I think we like hovered around uh, three, four people for, um, for a while. Uh, and then just in the last like six weeks, we're now like uh, with part-timers and stuff, we're up to nine, um, which is, exciting uh you know uh, a lot more growth happening there um and then uh we've also had a few people uh, our discord is very active um and so we have people um building stuff and contributing and, and reporting bugs uh and building their projects on top of it there's a um a universal basic income uh project that's uh trying to integrate us for example so yeah it's so the core team currently uh nine people and then um uh open source community yeah mm -hmm. super cool so so if, if, if this like when this is all like said and done and everything is working exactly um the way you want it to what's like mm -hmm. is there is there like a killer app in mind that you think like th that this will enable to exist um or um are you just kind of thinking that like you know all apps will be will be written this way in the future and there's not like some specific like new use case that you're trying to enable like how are you thinking about about like what what change you want to see yeah, so I like it is pretty broad, right? It's like literally let's rethink how we build web apps. Um, fundamentally, that thing I was saying at the beginning about like, well, let's flatten the stacks so that more people can, can get online. 
um, <clears throat> the number of websites, so I don't know about sites versus apps, right, for, as a metric, but the number of websites uh, is doubling every 18 months. Um, that's, that's a lot of uh, uh, stuff on the web, right? So more people need to be able to get on, online, uh, build stuff, share things, um, it's only going to increase. And by reducing the, um, the amount of education required and experience required and team sizes can get smaller too, uh, we can make more people, um, uh, more people able to do what, what we do, hope, hopefully. Um, and then also along the way, you know, stuff that weren't the original goal, but happened to fall out of this is like, um, everything's encrypted at rest. So there's no more data breaches passwordless off. I don't forget my password anymore, right? So like there's a few of these other things in there too that are kind of nice that you sort of fall out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I wanted to maybe jump into a little bit of the nerdier uh, questions I had. I saved those for the end in case uh, so I wouldn't scare everybody away. <laughs> so uh, if you if actually maybe I should look at the with the chat really quick and just see if there's any other questions that people have. Um, there is some uh, interesting philosophical questions. Maybe if we at the end, we I'll, I'll ask I'll ask you some of those that people are asking. But um, I wanted to ask you my nerdy questions. So uh, okay, yeah, okay. Well, let's 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 just jump into that. So um, so the first thing I noticed when you were showing the the um, like app being used in the browser was that. Um, you were on a URL that was like a subdomain of vision.codes, mm -hmm. I think is what it was, or vision. Mm -hmm. something like that. And um, so this is the thing that um, I've struggled with when I'm, I thought about, I thought about, you know, this, this kind of idea of like, you know, having an actual app that lives in your browser before. And I, I was actually talking, talking about this stuff with, with some people at NodeConf EU um, back in, I think, 2013. And when, when we were talking about it, like the biggest problem was like, well, you can't just, you know, go to the server every time and have them send you whatever they want. And like, hopefully that, that hopefully that, you know, it's not backdoored or it hasn't changed or it's, it's not broken in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we, we were struggling with was like this whole model of the web is sort of, you know, even to this day, even though, even though now we have these things like service worker that make offline first a little bit more possible, you still at the end of the day are like going to this server and it's sending you this code. And then you're kind of um, using this cache, this service worker cache to kind of make that like, um, for future requests, make you know make that be the source of truth, um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think at the time in 2013, what we were having having to do was I think this was before this worker, so we used this thing called App Cache, which doesn't um, exist anymore. Uh, that's being deprecated from all the browsers, but it was a way to sort of uh, in a very simple way to to sort of cache resources. And um, with that, we uh, we like did this little prototype where we made like a little Bootstrap um, JS file. And then permanently cached it with AppCache, and then um, forevermore that site would be like stuck at you know with that like Bootstrap file, and then that Bootstrap file would would have the ability to load in new versions of the app and to cache th those versions, and mm -hmm. it provided a little UI for you to be able to sort of see well okay like I'm on version one of the app and I'm on version two of the app and you could even switch between which one was active, um, but you had to have like really solid trust in this Bootstrap code that was you know, loaded initially. And as long as that was behaving correctly, it could verify that like the different versions of the app are all from the, from the same author and that, you know, um, and it could sort of verify that for you and, and, and do that in the background. And so anyway, this is all a way of saying like, um, uh, how, like, I guess the, qu the question is sort of, so when I looked into service worker before, it couldn't really do permanent caching. Like it, it always checks with the server every 24 hours to see if there's a new, mm -hmm file and so if you're if you're if you're using that to ensure that the the site is offline first is there still like a like is do we need to do we need the web standards to change in some way to help support this mm -hmm. use case better or like like what are you doing to make sure that that isn't a like a point of weakness in this whole thing right yeah i, I guess there's there's a few things in there um so i haven't actually tried taking my computer offline for like multiple days and, and trying to load the load the site. Um, but we do keep data on device um, with uh, just, you know, in, in browser storage, which, you know, in, in square quotes, you know, like may get, um, uh, may get cleared, right, by, by the browser. Uh, in practice, it seems like that happens when your device is low on space. 
specifically. So Apple says that they'll uh, any website that you haven't visited in seven days, they'll they'll clear the um, clear the data from. Um, but it's like really like asterisks, uh, you know, under certain cir certain circumstances, we do have to have a, a copy of it elsewhere, um, which is also um, uh, why everything then you know needs to be totally encrypted end to end you know etc right you should be able to be agnostic about where it's stored in terms of the the app itself um, because the like literally so you know you saw the um, the thing in the URL um, and by default yeah we're hosting them at uh, fission .app, uh and then we can map different domains to them um, we use uh, a, um, I guess it's a standard called a DNS link where you have a uh, underscore DNS link dot, and then the, um, the URL that you're at. And you put a text record in there of the, um, of well, the, the hash of the data that you wanna get. And so, because we're backed by IPFS, so there's really nothing saying that we couldn't do this with just you know straight HTTP. Um, it then, when you request that, they're all pointed at um, an IPFS gateway that says, oh, okay, you need the data from this hash. And then when it gets to the uh, front end, you can hash that again and be like, is this correct for what I see in DNS? So you can be guaranteed that it hasn't changed from what's in DNS. And if, if you control your own domain name, then uh, then you can be absolutely certain that it hasn't changed, that we haven't changed anything on you. There are uh, attempts to do this in a more like, um, you know, cryptographically secure way. So uh, the the company behind uh, IPFS Protocol Labs has uh, the interplanetary naming service, where it's a chain of updates that gets signed by your key, uh, by whoever's doing the updates. Um, it works uh, like the actual like that portion of it works great. Um, the downside is uh, in our testing, it takes like ninety seconds to connect and um, uh, you have to republish because you have to keep this live on the network. You have to republish it every day. So it's 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 a work in progress uh, in terms of having it be um, uh, you know, like guaranteed that it's the same site. But even if you have um, you know a, a site locally um, and somebody changes something you know maliciously, they could just say, "Oh yeah, this is totally still version one," which is why the hash is is pretty important, right? You can have mm -hmm. an actual guarantee and verify it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So then mutability is all done with DNS then. That's the, that's the mm -hmm. main way you do mutability. Okay. Other than DNS, yeah. so then like you're just sort of working with uh, the content addresses everywhere else in the system. Yeah. So the, the app itself has a single top level content address and then everything else below it is hash linked. And then same thing with your data. You have one top level um, hash and then below everything's hash linked. Uh, so you're guaranteed that if you're grabbing from that hash, um, it's all the same and it's totally mutable. And then, yeah, uh, the mutable pointer is kept in uh, DNS. Um, but we're going to be pushing those over uh, um, PubSub on WebRTC as well uh, so that you can get faster than DNS updates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like uh, it looks like in the in the chat there's a bunch of questions, but you have somebody um, from, from your team, like, answering all of them. So I don't even know whether oh, I should awesome. ask you. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's just a fan. I don't know. <laughs> Why not both? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, go for it. I, I can't seem uh, to they, actually scroll this. So. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, I'll just here. I'll just show. We'll do a couple more questions from the chat, and then it's getting close to eight o'clock. So then we'll go into the social uh, part of the event after this. But um, here's a question. So um, I'll put it up on the screen too. Does Web Native hide the implementation details of having multi-writer with different devices, or is it up to app developers to make all these devices appear to share one identity? Mm. Uh, so all of the identity stuff is handled with that uh, JWT um, I mentioned before. So uh, uh, you can. Um, we've when you try to do things with the um, with an identity, like you know, I am so and so, the human behind all of these devices, it gets uh, challenging really quickly. Uh, so all that we don't really have a concept of identity, other than the person who created this originally um had access to this chained um uh, auth so all that you have really is you don't have um i mean everything's authenticated like 
cryptographically, but in terms of knowing like who the actual person was, we only have authorization rather than authentication. Um, so linking between devices, you share one of these um, between two um, key pairs, right? You you have uh, you construct a JWT, you point at the um, the ID of the device or app that you want to uh, share it with, and then you have that that link um, between them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's all that's all taken care of by web native, yeah. Super cool. Um, let's see. Let's do another question from the from the chat. Um, I guess you already answered the identity question. Um, it looks like this person in, in the chat is really doing a good job of answering all all the all the <laughs> questions that have come up. So um, I, maybe I'll maybe I'll give you as as a final question this this one that's a little bit more philosophical, which is from um, someone who's asking about how um, you think about. Oh, it's Forrest. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, is it? Uh, it's, okay. it's my co-founder. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So this is a kind of non-technical question, but um, here I'll just put it on the screen. It's a, it's a it's a long one, but it's oh, okay. It doesn't even fit. Um, it's basically asking about how you think about um, you know what is what is it like to work on distributed systems while um, you know we're, we're especially in the current moment that we're in now, where like it seems like a lot of the the danger um, is coming from public spaces that are weakly regulated. This is I'm reading the person's question. This is their words when it comes to speech. So how do we feel safe making stuff that empowers individuals and challenges power structures? Like where where is the the hope and faith and not like uh, optimism? For this stuff coming from, <laughs> maybe that's a a good note to end it on. If if you're, because I'm assuming you're extremely optimistic about all this stuff. Uh, uh, I I am and I'm not right. So uh, I also to sort of pull pull the the, the concepts apart a, a little bit. So there's distributed systems and then there's decentralization, right? So distributed systems, no question that that's going to be a thing. We want documents that we can live collaborate. Um, you know, stuff works offline and you can make changes and have it merged in automatically, like all, all of that stuff we want, right? Like, no question. Um, decentralization um, is, is yeah, it's a, a bigger question. And it's one of these things where, you know, technology will not save us, right? We have to have norms in a society about what is and isn't okay and what, um, uh, what we are and are not allowed to do. So we've created a end-to-end -end encrypted uh, file sharing enabled file system. Could that possibly be used for bad purposes? Yeah, totally. And if we find, discover that somebody's using it for those reasons, will we, as much as we can, deplatform them? Absolutely, right? But uh, there's nothing that, like, technology itself is, um, uh, can can be used for for uh, good or ill. So this this is you know is it a question that keeps me up at night of like you know what if somebody uh, uses this to share child porn right? It's like that that is bad. Um, mm -hmm. Can we block that and because it's content addressable, have a hash and maintain a bad hash list that nobody is allowed to to push that around anymore? Totally. Are there ways around that? Yeah, in the same way that uh, it's been really hard to take the Pirate Bay offline for 20 years, right? So it's um, the the web itself was really designed to be resilient uh, against, um, uh, I mean, in, in its case, you know, or the internet against, in its case, you know, nuclear attack, but, um, you know, can, uh, uh, can, can that's, you know, that strength where it's, resilient and everybody can participate and it's it's open and all this stuff can also be used um, for, for bad reasons. Yeah, t totally. And we need to regulate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that gets lost in this stuff too is it's it's like centralized systems are also used for a lot of bad stuff. And it's not like centralization yeah. is a is a cure-all at all by any means, right? 